one of the main reasons why people might think it's overblown is because, you know, GPT-4 current chatbots aren't actually that capable. And uh, I, I grant that. Um, I, I think the main thing I'd like to emphasize, though, is that we're on a very fast trajectory. So it could be the case that in a few years, then we're actually talking about something that's potentially catastrophic. So if we're talking like cyber capabilities, for instance, like them being able to hack, I, I think we'd be potentially exposing yourself to some catastrophe in like, let's say like 2026. I think like bioweapons, for instance, um, being a, a concern, um, that seems like fairly plausible for uh, 2025 of it being within the capacity of some of these systems to like, emulate the it's not that difficult it's that's that next difficult. year <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> Shit. hello everyone welcome to the win-win podcast today's episode is all about ai and specifically how to make humanity's transition into this upcoming ai age go as well as possible because i'm speaking to one of the world's leading experts in ai risk dan hendricks Dan is a director for the Center of Safe AI, which is probably best known for that mitigating risks letter that made headlines last year when it was signed by 500 of the most prominent names in AI, including Demis Hassabis, Sam Altman, and Jeffrey Hinton. He's also an accomplished researcher and key advisor to XAI, Elon Musk's AI company that launched last year. And together with my occasional co-host, Igor, we dig into everything from the risks of corporate arms races or even militarization of AI, near-term problems like deepfakes to emerging problems like the potential for rogue agents, and how to find win-win solutions to seemingly impossible trade-offs. All important topics, because if we want to reap the benefits that AI could bring to humanity, we have to be frank about the many risks it poses too. So, on that note, here's Dan Hendricks. So Dan, many people, when they hear the topic of AI and AI risk, have sort of come to the conclusion that concerns about AI risks are somewhat overblown, or at the very least, that the existing laws that we have would be sufficient to uh, take care of any risks that might come from AI. So I'm curious to hear, first of all, what, what you would say to something like that, and can you think of any specific examples where our laws are currently insufficient? So I think that one of the main reasons why people might think it's overblown is because, you know, GPT-4 current chatbots aren't actually that capable. And uh, I, I grant that. Um, I, I think the main thing I'd like to emphasize, though, is that we're on a very fast trajectory. So it could be the case that in a few years, then we're actually talking about something that's potentially catastrophic, something that could be, you know, weaponizable, um, and cause a lot of damage. Uh, so I think that most of the risk discussion is highlighting what could happen in the uh, amazing trajectory that we're on rather than, being, uh, rather than us being concerned about uh, currently existing models, which I think that currently existing models, they're, they're fine to open source, they're, they're, they're not causing catastrophes. Um, uh, we, we de there are definitely um, issues to address with them, uh, uh, but, but they're not at a, you know, a civilization disrupting level. Is, is there a specific example of a law, though, where you feel that what we currently have is insufficient? Like, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a woman who's got a lot of images of herself online, and like Taylor Swift, for example, has just been in the news because mm -hmm. there were these deep fake porn images made of uh, made about her, and she's considering going after the website that distributed them. Um, so, to me, that seems one particular example where the law is just lagging behind. Like, okay, sure, yes, people have been able to Photoshop women's heads onto pornographic images for a long time. But in the, with the rate of progress of generative AI, it feels like it, you know, it won't be long until there are very realistic videos that you can barely tell, you know, you can't tell truth from fiction and that could be used to blackmail women or just generally be out there on the internet and now there's nothing they can do about it. So that's one particular example, but I feel like that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? Yeah, so there are a lot of laws that aren't clarified, so we don't know exactly how many of them would be interpreted or actually transfer over to AI. Take, for instance, some laws about bioterrorism. So in the future, there's some concern that people could use AIs to create create bioweapons. But uh, a lot of those laws will say um, if there's if the um, system is or if the 
entity is knowingly trying to cause harm. And knowingly is fairly difficult to establish for an AI system. So a lot of legal verbiage about intent, uh, recklessness, negligence, um, uh, knowing, uh, a lot of those aren't necessarily applicable. So it's definitely up to the, the, the courts to specify how we should end up interpreting them. I suppose as well, there just aren't really AI specific laws on the books. It, it, normally we wouldn't expect that, uh, um, uh, we don't need to worry about uh, nuclear power or nuclear power plant safety because, you know, there are laws against killing people. So um, we'll just have <laughs> if, if, if the nuclear power plant melts down or something and people die in the process, you know, laws will take care of it. That's, that's not our attitude for basically any industry. You could make the same argument about about uh, um, about airplanes and uh, and cars. So um, there's really nothing specific on the books for for AIs as well. So I, I just wouldn't expect that the law to be sufficiently comprehensive. I mean, separately, the law is trying to establish some basic guardrails. It's not trying to um, encourage them to um, be highly socially beneficial. In the U.S., we're having laws that are very minimal um, so that people can do a lot with the technology, but that's quite different from how we should end up governing it. Inside of the law, how do we use it most beneficially and to improve society? And that's, that's a separate discussion. So I, I wouldn't rest on the law to, to solve our, all of our societal problems with respect to AI. Yeah, I think that the point around that the language is designed for other use cases than AI is kind of really relevant. For example, with um, bombing instructions, being able to spread them on the internet, it is illegal to do so if there is an intent yet again. But like that is off, uh, for the recipient of those instructions to use it in a malicious way or something. Then it becomes illegal, as far as I know. So it... it is I think that the design of such laws uh, is not considering the scale and the ease of some of the later uses. So at the point when you can um, distribute some biotechnologies uh, or bioweapons or other potential bombs basically to millions or hundreds of millions of people and it becomes very, very easy by just asking a question to kind of find out how to uh, follow the instructions you're changing the amount of potential users. Like it's, it's, it's a very old and known thing that the lower the friction in a product or service, the higher the amount of users becomes, right? So with some of these like bombing instructions, it's, it's just, okay, so yes, you could have found it by Googling. Many of the things you can find by Googling, for example, but the Googling doesn't create the same scale. So like right. given that you are creating completely different scales and completely different ease of access, I think it does make sense to uh, adjust it a little bit. Because similarly, otherwise, in your example with the deepfakes, it's like, well, it is possible. It's just, it's not, it takes a lot of work to otherwise do it with Photoshop, right? And mm -hmm. now it's going to be just like click, click of a, a button. button. So you kind of have to change it a little bit. Well, one thing I'd like to emphasize, though, is um, about bioweapons. So, like, what's the, the, the threat model? Because I think most people aren't aware. Um, so uh, the reason there's some concern about bioweapons is... Uh, because it does reduce the barriers to entry substantially for creating some particularly catastrophic weapons. So right now you'd need to have like a top virology PhD to um, try and come up with an extremely destructive bioweapon, one that would kill tens of millions of people. So although the information is online, you could read <laughs> all of the latest textbooks in virology and, and study that for several years. Um, the information is out there. There's a question of how easily is it uh, assimilated and synthesized for you to, to operate at that level. Right. Uh, so there are some cookbooks for some very simple bioweapons online, but uh, they're, they're not at the scale of the ones that uh, a virology expert could uh, end up um, uh, unleashing on society. So uh, that's how um, AI changes the game relative to uh, just browsing some papers online uh, in the future. But you often hear the quote that roughly 1% of the population has psychopathy. And <clears throat> I, I don't know how that correlates to I, IQ level, but another quote you often hear is the the number of IQ points it require, required to make a severe, you know, kill kill a hundred million people reduces by a certain number every every five years because of the democratization of technology. So <clears throat> this actually sort of leans into an area of of risk known as malicious risk, uh, because you you actually wrote a paper recently, you and your team called an overview of catastrophic risks, uh, which tries to sort of categorize the four different flavors of risks related to AI. You've got uh, malicious use, 
bad actors, basically, what, you know, like by risk of bioterrorism, ter- uh, organizational risks, so accidental outcomes, AI gone rogue. Uh, so I guess that's sort of more in the realm of the classic like Terminator-esque arguments people make. And then uh, fourthly, uh, the sort of arms race related risks. So I'd love to dig into all four of these, um, but I know which one is most on my mind. And I'm really curious to hear, first of all, which which of these four categories is most concerning to you? Oh, uh, well, I think the the in the short term, I think uh, malicious use is a substantial risk in the the short term, like we're talking, you know, like on a one to two year horizon. And if we're zooming out, you know, going across a decade or in the next decade or uh, or so, then then I, I think these sort of structural risks, these risks of competitive pressures, these these arms race dynamics end up being the main drivers of what we end up seeing in AI later and carry most of the, the risks. So uh, it, it can vary. Um, maybe we could do better at addressing some malicious use risks in the short term. Um, uh, like if we improve c- civilizational biodefenses, for instance, like we do better wastewater monitoring or we have... Um, uh, we have um, uh, better um, uh, air purification in airports and things like that to limit the spread of these. You know, if we take care of some of those issues, then I think malicious use is, is less of a concern. Uh, but uh, these, <laughs> these, these, these risks from competitive pressures uh, are um, uh, present right now, and they seem very difficult to get rid of. So, Yeah, I find the malicious use ones are a good example of this idea of uh, where differential technological improvement could be applied. So you want to first develop some of the defense techs, then the uh, other side of the coin where some actors can go out and do a bad thing now doesn't lead to such bad a harm anymore, right? So like you pointed out, uh, air purification, better sterilization of just like uh, surfaces, general air, of course, then like better For PPE, UVC better or antivirals, and like actually effective vaccines, just like a bunch of things could exist such that the bioweapons risk could actually be significantly reduced. And then we could um, harness the benefits of all of the things that uh, AI applied to virology and applied to uh, biotech would generally also bring. Of course, we want that. We want right. the medical benefits. It's just that, yeah, at which point, like how big is the benefit? How big is the cost? And like, can we do something quickly against the cost first? With these arms race dynamics, can you explain the different flavors that are emerging? So maybe this is a bit of a long answer. There are like three examples that come to mind. There's there's in the military domain, there's in this um, uh, there's in this uh, corporate uh, domain currently, and then being more forward-looking, we can imagine AIs directly competing against AIs. So in the military, military domain, you could imagine um, uh, uh, there's uh, a process at least going on right now where um, Militaries are starting to invest in these AI technologies and will steadily be replacing people with these um, AI systems if there aren't any uh, checks on having lethal autonomous weapons. Eventually, in the long run, this means that we'd probably have our military in large part um, uh, having many of its decisions made by uh, AI systems. Uh, this is a concern later. You could you could imagine if there's a conflict between the the U.S. and China, our AI systems are not completely reliable. Um, they could get in a situation where um, where they need to uh, uh, keep um, outsourcing more and more power to these um, to these militarized AI systems because if they don't, then they'll get defeated. <laughs> right. the, basically, the only way to stay relevant to to maintain influence is to keep having more and more AI systems and making them make more of the decisions. So this exposes us to some type of risk, risk-taking behavior. Let's say that there's like a, a 5% chance that we lose control of our, of our systems um, because they're not highly reliable. Well, that would still possibly be rational for some of these militaries, if they're just completely self-interested, to go ahead and keep making, uh, keep giving these AI systems more and more power. Because if they don't, there's a 100% chance that they're going to be uh, wiped out or irrelevant right. or lose in any type of competition. So these are how these, these, these structural uh, um, pressures, these, the, the, the structure of the environment around us ends up uh, meaning that uh, we end up absorbing a lot more risk than what would normally be reasonable. Uh, so it, I think these, these structural risks really um, exacerbate and compound these other types of risks, like these, these rogue AI risks or these, these risks of accidents. We, we become much more accepting um, 
of those other types of risks because we, we just have to comply with the competitive pressures around us. And we can kind of see a similar situation in the context of, uh, in, in the corporate sphere. So there we, we've seen that we can have some initially good intentions that we want to build safe AI and make it extremely beneficial for humanity. And that's the main thing we care about. So we're going to be, you know, like a safety nonprofit. And so this is, you know, open AI. Um, but, you know, to maintain relevance, um, the thing you have to do is you've got to raise more capital. So that means, okay, we're going to have to change our corporate structure um, and we're going to have to scale, scale, scale and advance timelines and um, you know, there, there are arguments about whether that was overall a good or bad thing, but, uh, you know, some people there didn't think this was a good thing. The, the, the people at OpenAI who then formed Anthropic, and they're like, we're going to create the, the new safety organization, and we're going to do things differently and much more responsibly. And then, you know, a year later, oops, those competitive pressures, well, we don't want to lose influence, and we need to keep up, so what do we got to do? We basically have to imitate what the other competitors are doing, um, so they're kind of like an, an open AI clone now. Um, so that's where we're seeing these, these uh, competitive pressures um, uh, and uh, end up shaping some of the, the main actions or main events in, um, in AI development. Um, and a lot of these other values uh, end up getting eroded or competed away or losing, losing their force or emphasis. So um, we can see this in the corporate sphere as well, where there'd just be incentives to cut corners on safety. If, if you're the safest one um, and you're um, absorbing a lot of costs by adversarially training your models and spending so much on safety, sorry, you're the other competitor uh, that is um, uh, spending much less on this is not, um, not harming themselves as much. Right. Uh, so uh, there's there's uh, there's an incentive to stop doing that or not invest as much in that because um, then you're going to give them some sort of lead. This is also why we can't pause as well. Uh, although these companies are concerned about uh, existential risk from these AI systems in the longer term, and they know that <laughs> um, we haven't made much progress on understanding that issue at a technical level or improving it substantially, nonetheless, they can't really... Um, uh, they can't really pause themselves because if they do that, the more unscrupulous actors will gain a competitive <laughs> edge, and they'll end up uh, they'll end up uh, influencing the future. A Moloch problem. So uh, some people have made the point that uh, these uh, pressures from the market would select for uh, AIs to be safe because the market wouldn't want to produce products to the users or services that are unsafe. And I think a mistake that is being made there is uh, that the market doesn't select for safety. The market selects for things that are just safe enough such that they can be released to uh, end customers or users. And that, that, that there's a mistake that, that has been made, and it's evidently so. If uh, we look at recent um, events that happened with uh, 3M was recently fined, I think one of the largest or maybe the largest fine ever, uh, of $10 billion for PFA, PFAS chem chemicals that were... These forever chemicals. Uh, yeah, that they not only were releasing and that cannot uh, they don't, they get don't, out they don't, of the they don't water the and like everywhere where they leached into, uh, leaked into, but rather they also knew of that already for a long time. Internal documents came out. They were aware of the dangers. They were aware that they're producing those harms and they just swept it under the rug. It's the same story... It's the same story that happened with asbestos as well. All of the companies that were mining and creating asbestos for the use of insulation, fire resistance, etc., they also knew this for decades. And they just continued producing it because the market, without the information, and with this being long-term, not immediately visible harm, so there, the feedback loop on the unsafe part was just not short enough. So that's why I think in many of these cases, uh, the, they, they were still able to release the products. So I would imagine with some of this, um, in particular where yeah, the, the feedback loop is broken, is where the market will not be good at uh, in, in, including safety in it. And I especially with, with something, if, if things are going faster and faster, the, the, the feedback loop for the market needs to be even tighter. Right. And it's clearly not sufficient. Like there isn't sufficient information between consumer and producer in order to prevent ex externalities. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, AI, AI developers themselves have quite a bit of difficulty even keeping up reading about what's going on in the first place, let alone um, having these be battle tested in the market and uh, <laughs> um, all the incentives um, uh, uh, finally being aligned with, um, you know, appropriate counteraction and, and, you know, people suing in the event of some sort of catastrophe or regulation being in put in place to, to make sure nobody's cutting corners um, on safety. Uh, so it's, it, it is moving a bit too quickly for that I, as well. I, I, there are some economic incentives for safety, though. But if we think about this over a longer time period, it doesn't seem like we're particularly setting up a safe ecosystem. So we can imagine that, you know, right now we're having AI systems write some of our emails in the future. They'll be, you know, running around on our computer, you know, completing PowerPoints and doing very, various tasks for us, filling out Excel sheets. And uh, they'll act more like assistants and, you know, time will go on and they'll get even more and more capable and replace, um, replace entire jobs. Uh, the, the point might come that they would also be really good managers. You know, they can you know keep a thousand things in their head at once, and uh, they can um, uh, they can work constantly. Um, they can process more information more quickly, and are extremely knowledgeable, et cetera, et cetera. So, what, what happens in this process is it basically makes sense as an as a company to replace people with these AI systems, and you become dependent on these systems. Um, uh, it's it's difficult to um, uh, undo that or get rid of the AI system because it was improving your profitability and your competitors are also adopting these systems too. So we have another collective action problem. Right. Um, th this process over time means you're getting the economy increasingly moving moving faster, faster than you can keep up with, um, faster, um, uh, and you can't have as much oversight as to what's going on as well. Uh, you need uh, to solve the new problems that come up, um, you need AI systems to deal with them because they're the only ones capable and uh, fast enough to, to deal with them. So there's this sort of self-reinforcing feedback loop that kicks in. So people aren't making like the the effective decisions and they're creating a, more of a, an ecosystem that they don't quite understand. They, they could be advised by the AI that if you do this decision, uh, it will be you'll get better results or something. And we don't actually have too much of an understanding of, of what's going on. Hopefully... Um, hopefully that system is sufficiently prescient as well and able to to aggregate all the information appropriately on on our behalf. Um, not clear that that would happen. They're 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 very good at what they do. They are quite uncanny in many of the um, mistakes that they that they make. Um, uh, but um, uh, overall, uh, you, you get a drift to humans not actually making many of the decisions and that the AI systems are the ones making these sorts of decisions. So um, uh, I don't know if that's necessarily a safe outcome, but I think that's what the market ends up selecting in the long run is, is people not actually being in control or particularly aware of what's going on um, uh, inside of that system. So uh, as well, one, one could take this even a bit further. Um, uh, these these AI systems later then are directly competing with each other too, mm. um, and when that happens, then you start getting some pretty pernicious selection effects for the ones that are the most capable, uh, most most competitive, maybe the most ruthless in this environment, which which end up being the um, <clears throat> this is sort of a more of a survival of the fittest dynamic among these different systems. Uh, and I think that's possibly setting us up for an ecosystem that we don't quite control, that we're giving a looser and looser leash um, and is being steered by um, some structural forces uh, that um, select for uh, more uh, behaviors that help them survive the most, which is not necessarily the ones that help humans survive the most. So going specifically to the corporate arms race, it feels like, yes, a lot of the CEOs are technically doing the rational thing, right? They've got these short-term metrics that they have to hit, not only in terms of um, fiduciary duty type, uh, type incentives, but also, uh, yeah, keeping their, their employees happy because like, the employees want to be the ones releasing the biggest, coolest projects or, or publishing. Um, they, they've also got... Yeah, and then they've also got pressures between, well, at least I often hear them always say, well, what about China? Like, if we, if we slow down, then we're going to, America's going to uh, fall behind China and leave us vulnerable to that. So it, it feels like at every, at every point, there's the, the incentives are overwhelming. So the question is, I guess, is how much of the, the solutions, solution space to this would come from sort of redesigning the rules of the game itself versus 
trying to shift the mindsets of the major players? Because it feels like looking at the different CEOs leading the biggest companies, there's a quite a broad range of personalities. There are some that are, they're, they're, they're saying that it's a concern, safety is a concern, they don't want to be going as far, fast as they are, but they, you know, they acknowledge the arms race. And there are others who basically downplay the arms race or in some cases are even trying to speed it up. Like there's one, who, uh, I won't say his name, but there's a major CEO of a big company who was like, I want to show people I, ma I made my competitor dance. Like th this is not the type of mindsets that I would hope to see in a, in a CEO. Well, if, if, if you're a profit maximizing investor, then that's exactly the type of mindset you want to see. <laughs> it's kind of part of the problem. But right. for something as impactful, potentially not, yes. Yeah, totally. So what kind of incentive structures or redesigns do you think carry the most promise? Well, so I'd like to comment on that there's one incentive in AI development, which is also just to have the most performance system, which are increasingly more and more inscrutable and less transparent and more black box than the generations that came before them. Uh, so they're, they're actually, um, uh, that, that's just an additional factor I'd stack on top of, we got to have national competitiveness with China and we got to race against our competitors. But then also we got to have the best AI systems, which generally happen to be ones that we understand less and less. Right. In terms of fixing the incentives, this is kind of difficult because um, uh, there isn't any organization that can at least internalize the externalities of an existential risk. Um, <laughs> if people go extinct, I mean, who's, gonna, who's going to go That's after <laughs> them? Um, so uh, there's, there's a limit to how well we can, we can uh, um, create some penalties. Um, but we, we could imagine something lighter, which would at least penalize uh, catastrophic um, uh, outcomes from AI systems, so potentially better liability laws um, imposed on AI developers may be a way to um, to uh, create incentives for them to follow at least the uh, best practices and not feel as though um, adding a lot of these safety features is a is an encumbrance that they're just doing to, to signal, but it actually makes sense for for their bottom line. So that's something that in the that sort of payoff matrix in the in the prisoner's dilemma would would actually change the numbers and make it possibly rational for them not to defect and cut corners, but um, actually implement some some safety features. So that's at least one in the um, that's at least one in the the corporate sphere that could be helpful. Liability laws. So basically, because like the 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 assumption of what it means to be negligent should also be dependent to a degree uh, on the scale of harm that you can produce, which is why you would like potentially have the different liability laws, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, mm -hmm. it's unfortunate that uh, the the quote that always comes to mind is actually from Spider Man. Uh, I think it's from Spider Man, but it's uh, with great power comes great responsibility. I feel like it's a very natural kind of thing that uh, makes sense, but and I think Spider Man got it right. Mm -hmm. Hey, some sometimes they're <laughs> always they're really a comic spot books. on, but yeah. uh, it is very I think intuitive to assume a higher burden on something that has higher impact in even if it's net good, but can go to both sides much further. Then you still have mm -hmm. to place a slightly higher burden on it. I'll also note that one thing that doesn't seem to matter that much would be verbal commitments to safety. So <laughs> it actually needs to be something externally imposed with teeth. Um, if it's a verbal commitment to safety, I just it seems that people don't really notice or particularly mind these if, if they end up reneging on it. So, for instance, and I'm not I'm not attacking OpenAI for you know be, be, for out of you know um, I, because I have an axe to grind or anything like that, but um, they just have a lot of good examples of this. Um, but overall, I still think they're you know a, a, um, a very thoughtful uh, AI developer, um, especially in contrast to to some other ones. Um, but anyway, they had things like a windfall clause that when we get some profit, we will be very pro-social and we will distribute that onto people. But like, you know, quietly, they'll just adjust the windfall clause to like grow. Um, uh, there's like when we make back 100 percent of the profit, then the remainder of the profit or 100 times the profit, the remainder of the profits go to the people. They change that so that it's that cap grows like exponentially by like 20 percent each year so. Um, such that it's like relatively, relatively ineffective. Nobody really noticed, or or they'll have like there's a merge and assist clause. Uh, we will we will help if we're near AGI. We're going to merge with the other organizations, and we will we will try to um, develop it as safely as possible, so as to reduce some competitive dynamics. I think uh, a lot of them actually have fairly short timelines. I don't think any of them are 
uh, seriously feeling out trying to do some merge and assist type of move. So there's a lot of these lip service is very valuable, but I, I think that historically, when people are not even making any effort to live up to it, um, uh, it, it doesn't really seem to to, to matter that much. So um, so I, I'd focus on uh, uh, things that do have somewhat more teeth and not depend on an individual actor to try to um, fix the incentives and sort of rewrite the system for everybody else. Um, they're just not large enough to do that. Right. So you're saying it, the 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 rewriting has to come from some external body that outside of the game. Yeah, because it's not rational for it otherwise. It has to. Um, e- even if they cooperate and do the pro social thing, there's all the other pra- there's all the other actors who would behave differently. Right. So classic um, And then they'll price that in, and then they'll defect as well because they go, "Well, if we do it, nobody else will, and that will harm us." So it'll just be that over. And, and over. even if they're like potentially great people working there, it's 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 just a bad system to design. And I understand the people that worry about regulatory capture there. To have the people who are who may become responsible for harms to be the ones writing the laws, it just doesn't quite make sense. Totally, we no. haven't allowed that in other yeah, areas the, the, much the, as well. The potential for bias there is just too strong. Um, yeah. So, what kind of body would you like to see? Well, do you think the existing international or at least supposedly independent institutions we have are sufficient, or do we need a new body to write these laws? All these regulations. So for writing the laws, it's very difficult. So if it's if it's if it's extremely international, has you know 100 plus countries in it or something, it's going to operate way too slowly. Mm. Um, uh, by the time the um, planning group for the working group is announced, <laughs> you know, it's uh, two years have gone by. So right. <laughs> there there are potentially some other ways of changing the incentives. So. One way could be having an international AI organization. Like an IAEA? More like a CERN for AI, where this is where AI development is happening. Uh, you know, the, the Western allies are not racing with each other to try and develop AI. This is a sort of one of the de facto places where, where AI is developed. And the um, next shipment to GPUs is, is going here because we don't want it going to this sort of, you know, random company that we don't have influence over it. We want it going over to our shared project. So that's one that, um, that that's some potential um, structure, some international project um, uh, could end up being um, uh, uh, viable and fix some of these incentives, reduce these competitive pressures. You, of course, get some other sorts of risks from this too, which would be some misuse by people at this organization. Um, that they would get extraordinarily powerful, um, but um, th- there may be ways of there may be ways of, of offsetting that if it's very democratically accountable, and you you know take various steps to make sure that there um, isn't isn't internal collusion. You make you keep it separated from the military so that you can um, uh, so that it can be counteracted if it goes rogue or anything like that. Um, those would be some ways of uh, possibly making this incentive better. But I think the default trajectory, though, internationally, I would expect is these, these AI companies are actually not the most relevant actors in five years' time, but instead militaries, mm-hmm. uh, because these, these tools are um, capable of being weaponized to do things like cyber attacks and take down energy grids, um, so they're, they're very relevant technologies and for, for national security. In fact, they're possibly the most relevant beyond, beyond nuclear weapons. So uh, that could be a top priority of the, these different countries to race on that front and primarily do so with, their, with the military. Um, the military could just conscript um, or use something like the Defense Production Act to right, um, demand take companies yeah. to basically do their bidding. Right, yeah. I mean, I, I think I agree as well. It makes all the incentives seem to be pointing in that direction and especially as it does feel like the world is getting you know, international relations is getting more as opposed to less hostile right now the the trend over the last few years hasn't been great so is are, are treaties our best hope for that because i mean there have been historical examples of treaties working pretty well if you look at the history of nuclear weapons yes okay Things were very bad in the beginning from the 40s into the 50s and up to the 80s. The number of nuclear weapons was going up and up as the arms race between USSR and the USA got worse and worse. But then the start was that the Nuclear Arms Reduction Treaty came into effect in 1990 and that reduced the number of nuclear weapons on Earth by about a factor of four. So under rational game theory, like that shouldn't be possible, right? Under the Moloch 
Mo- Moloch's forces, you, mm-hmm. you, it should mm-hmm. be just forcing everyone to go up and up and up and that escalation, escalation. And yet mm-hmm. a treaty came in which did reduce the number of nuclear weapons. So why did that treaty work? And are there lessons that we can draw from that to apply to any potential <clears throat> non-military, non-military use of AI internationally? I, I'm uh, usually coming from the perspective in international relations that states will just do what will make sense to um, secure their power relative to to competitors. Um, and from that perspective, there could possibly be some types of treaties that uh, look very pro-social that um, actually just fix the incentives for for um, uh, most parties involved, but uh, and still um, uh, increase their relative power or preserve theirs. Take, for instance. Um, uh, a biological weapons convention. Uh, that we could think is, wow, we, we, we made agreements about bioweapons. This must be because we you know, came together as humans hand in hand and we just recognized our common humanity. We don't want to go down that route. Instead, you could view it differently. You could say that the U.S. Has, and the USSR and others have, have nuclear weapons. This makes them very powerful. Bioweapons make um, <laughs> a lot poorer nations extremely powerful. Um, so let's try and um, get some strong norms to not allow other people, other nations to have those types of weapons of mass destruction because that levels the playing field a bit too much. Um, so that's something that made humanity overall safer and was still uh, comported with the incentives of some of the powerful actors at the time. Um, I think one issue with uh, treaties uh, would be that uh, you know, they could lie. Uh, so do we have good verification regimes? Uh, a country could say, yes, we will be very safe about this. But it's, it's not clear that uh, they'll, they'll actually do what they, they said. Um, uh, with other things like um, in, in inspecting uh, chemical plants and things like that, uh, maybe there's more verification. But uh, verification for AI might be more difficult. That we'll need to, uh, to investigate a lot more. Um, I think that there is a way of having the incentives um, all work um, internationally, um, uh, based on the fact that there's the, there's uh, a lot of, um, interdependencies in the supply chain for GPUs. So although they come out of TSMC, a lot of the precursors, necessary precursors that you can't easily replace, um, are, uh, come from the U S and NATO allies, uh, uh, about 90 plus percent, um, of them. Uh, so, uh, if they have something like a shared project, They'd say the GPUs go to the thing that we share. We don't want it going to the thing that we don't have as much influence over, like this this one random project in in your country. Uh, And that could make them work collectively. Another thing that we could have is um, that could fix incentives is is um, getting um, getting or having more prescience about what's to come from AI systems. So it's when people think about this, um, uh, they. it, it, it unsettles them after there's a big capabilities jump and then they'll, you know, they'll, wow, what's going on? And they'll bury their head in the sand, you know, a month later and then just kind of assume that we'll always be living with the technology like this. Maybe it'll get a little more extreme, but, you know, it, it's not going to get, you know, it's not going to start replacing jobs anytime or um, that, that's, you know, decades away. So um, <clears throat> this is kind of our attitude, attitude toward AI developments. And if we could... Um, uh, normalize or help people see, you know, this is what might happen five years down the road if we um, uh, if we keep um, acting in this way. That could get them to go, oh, it is within my longer term incentives to be acting differently. I, I think us understanding what are what we're getting ourselves into, what's going on, and in general epistemics would be um, uh, critical for avoiding these longer t- what are currently longer term consequences of AI systems. Yeah, the information sharing was um, what. Would have helped, for example, in the examples I previously gave, where the uh, um, market not having uh, adjusted for the well sufficiently supplied the safety around asbestos and PFAS chemicals. It was an information asymmetry, which is usually one of the reasons when markets don't work, right? Right. Um, and <laughs> but the there is a bad way to have symmetry, which is neither the uh, developer of the AI model knows how it works internally outside of just like the broad 500 line code architecture, nor the user. Therefore, we're <laughs> good and markets work. That's that's not the way, right? We should have a symmetry in both having deep knowledge of it. Uh, which, which um, and I, I wonder where where is the field that is looking at kind of like what's going on internally and why is it doing what it's doing? Which goals does the model have? Like called mechanistic interpretability. Where where has it currently been? I've seen that there have been some 
small advances or were they actually large? Where do you, how, how have you seen it going? I think in terms of overall understanding of the system, I will not anticipate that we'll be able to select, you know, a random part of the system and, you know, um, uh, be able to say, oh, this is why, this is that, and answer multiple why questions about it. I, I, I don't think that's the case for um, a lot of these complicated systems. And I think that the more performant systems generally get higher and higher in complexity. Uh, so um, I don't think that'll end up turning out too well. I do think there might, we could possibly get more clarity though about how to control uh, the system better, even if we can't understand all of the, the, the whys of each part. Uh, so, you know, we, we can, to some extent, control AI systems. We can't do so with high reliability. We don't really understand the intrinsics of them well at all. Uh, we still can nonetheless, you know, fine tune them to fulfill our, our various requests. They'll often go off the rails um, and they can be jailbroken. And these are very difficult problems. But um, uh, uh, I, I can, I, I predict that we won't have substantial, complete understanding of these systems, but maybe we'll be able to control them. There's a question at a reasonable level, there's a question of reliability, of course. Um, mm -hmm. And as you, you sort of emphasized earlier, that the markets will kind of um, uh, locate the point where it's like just safe enough to release them. Can you quickly just explain what you mean by interpretability and why these, what you're talking about is a little bit different to what happens with normal software and understanding how that works? So normal software uh, is where coders are writing each line specifically. Every um, part of the system is coming through through them and their understanding, and it's very logic driven. There's specific rules and and control flows, but they specify everything. Um, meanwhile, with AI systems, we instead specify a very high level program. We say, here's a big blob of data. Here's some um, abstract objective, like predict the next word. Now go learn for <laughs> several months, and then out comes some system. So we're, we're, we're operating at a much higher level of abstraction. We're kind of designing AI systems um, uh, with like a broad principle, um, kind of like just like evolving a system or something like that, or, or growing a system as opposed to meticulously designing every single aspect. So our level of control and precision and, and understanding of what comes out um, is, is quite different. Each part of software programs are coded by individuals, but each of the several hundred billion parameters in an AI system are not hand-selected. Um, uh, they're, they're automatically learned at, from AIs teaching themselves on a big blob of data that no person has read, and people don't know exactly what's in, in all of that. Um, and then the AIs will go through a loop of teaching themselves a bit too. Uh, so th this is what makes them much more inscrutable compared to software. And just to highlight the ratio uh, of, yeah, it's uh, like hundreds of gigabytes or dozens of gigabytes of uh, just numbers, basically, right? And then, or matrices, and then uh, next to it is how many is it kilobytes or megabytes? The amount of code that actually is interpretable by humans. I mean, it's a, a few thousand lines or so for the, the. I mean, in terms of in terms of the stuff that's like, but it can even be described more simply as just like here's here's some here's some specific loss or objective as they'll call it. It's you can you can write down on a, on the back of a napkin. Um, and then that that's basically uh, that, that basically specifies the system. Um, uh, it just then needs to train on like a supercomputer and like teach itself for a while, and <laughs> um, that, that that's how they're made. So uh, th this this is why I'm not terribly optimistic about is like understanding exactly what we're creating, and then when we're mixing all these things together and having them interact with each other in in ways that we can't keep up with, and uh, they're they're creating new um, structures and modes of communication and saying things to each other, sending sending big big vectors to each other of, of lots of floating point numbers, and that's how they're communicating. I, I I think that'll be a very interesting ecosystem if we can control it. For that said, we're uh, people are trying trying to do that right now, right? And like Chris Ola, mm -hmm. for example, has been focused on that. And so are um, like mm -hmm. uh, efforts at the labs as well. Like DeepMind, for example, has been working on it too. Uh, yeah, how, how has that been going? I, I've seen some progress around where it wasn't around selecting this particular neuron is doing particularly this, but rather they grouped it and then could understand it sometimes, what maybe like sections yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's uh, there's been a lot of work in trying to understand the um, the internals of them. Uh, the um, there are people who are approaching it from trying to understand things at like a, a neuron level, like the the individual you know floating point numbers. What does it mean? What does it correspond to? N neural networks um, have a lot of neurons in them. A collection of neurons is a larger firing pattern, 
And so a different approach to interpretability that's, that's emerged recently is just let's try and understand the um, overall firing patterns internally and characterize those. And so when an AI system is knowingly deceiving a person, let's say it's instructed to do so, it has a specific type of firing pattern. Is that currently the case, uh, that it has a specific firing pattern? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in, in, a, in a paper, I suppose the, the URL for this would be ai-transparency.org, or it's in a paper called Representation Engineering. There, there's been some success at getting uh, a lie detector that you know, works maybe like you know, 80% of the time or so. Now, this isn't, you know, particularly good because we need it to be 99.999 um, to, to, to feel safe. But th there's at least some way of um, uh, having a, a first pass at trying to control them by trying to control them at the level of their, their overall activation patterns um, instead of trying to intervene on, on specific neurons. That's something that we do with brains as well, right? Like with human brains, we have kind of like an equivalent situation where we know when you use language that comes out of this region and even like with more detail mm -hmm. when you uh, are in a high stress, for example, actually we even have firing patterns, right? Like that's what the different yeah. brain waves are, are basically just uh, the frequencies mm -hmm. with which the neurons um, like pass on information between each other. So for this uh, activation and firing pattern type of interpretability or control research, which I guess the, the name of that we're calling like representation engineering and several other authors, um, the uh, it, it, it works for controlling it to do basic things like, you know, don't be as power seeking, you know, tell the truth more, things like that. And it only works at some level of reliability, you know, not, not that great, but of course it's just, it's just a first paper. But one thing it really doesn't work for is if there is some type of secret program inside of the, the system, <laughs> um, we can't uh, really block that uh, currently. And that seems like these, these sort of hidden functionalities inside of networks are, quite difficult to tease out and um, will probably require extreme levels of reliability to to make sure we find those needles in the haystack. So uh, I would not bet on that being resolved in the next couple of years' time. Hmm. So to be clear, this we're also moving into the realm of uh, the category of risk to do with rogue AI, right? Which is the more technical, mm -hmm. how do we, if we're building systems that are ever more capable and eventually we'll get to... Uh, if trends continue, might get to a point where they are smarter, not only than, every, than individual humans, but even humans in aggregate. And thus, if we don't find a way to understand and align the preferences of those AI agents with whatever we actually want our preferences, you know, what outcomes that we really want, then we're opening up a can of worms of possibly losing control to systems that are doing things that we couldn't have even imagined, but that we don't actually want. Can you sort of talk us through the current state of progress or perhaps lack of progress of this alignment problem? Yeah, so um, I'll be maybe a little more controversial by um, partly suggesting that like the, the control is controlling these AI systems we can't like overall we're doing we're not doing like a terrible job at it like people are using these systems we're giving them requests they're they're doing what we're telling them to do so it's it's not as though we um have no ability to control them whatsoever i i do think there's a separate problem of getting them to be 99.999 percent reliable or highly reliable or reliable in the face of you know adversaries trying to exploit them and things like that so um uh but um so it's it's not um a, a hopeless problem necessarily uh, I think that um, most people concerned about AI risk these days have or, um, uh, are emphasized this scenario of a treacherous turn where uh, the, the AI is sort of on your side, it's doing what you want, and then suddenly it, it shifts in its behavior. You know, it gets more power, um, it, it escapes the, the sort of testing environment or something like that, or it's released uh, outside of the testing environment, or you, you know, you, you give it more control over the military or may, let it make more decisions there, and then, well, actually, I'm going to stage a coup or something like that. That's, of course, a much longer term type of, of, of fear. But um, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get like the, the bulk of, of these, of it sort of hiding its intentions through um, um, brain scanning -y type of, you know, neural activation understanding stuff. So I'm just a little more optimistic on the technical front. Right. Um, the main way in which I see like uh, us losing control um, without like it being um, structural pressures or anything like that, but just from the, the, the AI systems themselves 
is the case where we're having automated AI research and development, or maybe I'll just abbreviate it, automated research processes or ARPS. So with that, you can imagine it's five years in the future. Uh, um, one of the leading labs has uh, AI systems that are basically can research and are as, as, as smart as some of the world-class researchers in AI. And then you can make, you know, 10,000 of them. Um, and then you have a whole fleet of, of researchers. Then you say, go make our AIs even more powerful. And they, of course, are pressured to do that because of, uh, let's say, competitive pressures or, or so. Um, if we don't, somebody else will. So, yeah. Moloch again. In that situation, I just really don't know how such a process would play out. What are we going to do? Are we going to, are we going to prompt it especially well so that the, the systems that they, that they build will um, be um, completely controlled by us? Uh, it, it's just it's a very um, quick moving process to have that much um, intellectual um, labor at that at that caliber uh, that you might get decades worth of progress in a year. Uh, it, so that has more of the property of we have one chance to get it right. There aren't really do overs. Very hard to think about. Um, uh, and this isn't a, um, you know, uh, th this is a robust concern. Norbert Wiener, um, a, a long time ago, uh, emphasized this as a potential intelligence explosion. But at the same time, uh, what I'm hearing you say is that um, this worry, which is actually kind of the probably most uh, discussed 2010s AI safety worry, probably, uh, what is... Yeah, it, it it is is slightly one for you of a le uh, lesser concern, but also it kind of presupposes a few things, which is why I would understand that some people are not as worried about it because it presupposes that you can um, some design these automated uh, research programs, right? Uh, that they are of higher quality, that you haven't kind of built in sufficient lie detection, et cetera, et cetera, around it. And like while this is seems like yeah, eventually you'll be able to do that. To me. Um, that one does seem further away than the malicious use or the systemic pressures, right. military mm -hmm. uses, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I, I definitely, say, or even the centralization risks that some people worry about, right, mm -hmm. that we briefly mm -hmm. touched on. That's why I, I definitely sympathize with people who look at that and say, that's really far away, um, even though it might be closer, but it also is somewhat accurate, I think, to say that uh, there are these other concerns that um, are more likely to be in the immediate term. Yeah, and and they are themselves like catastrophic or potentially existential. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, like if you have civilization collapse because of some <laughs> from some bio. I mean, the, the Black Death killed like you know, what, ha almost half the population or so. I mean, this is um, uh, it's a bad be, time. Definitely civilization disrupting. Yeah. A, a different possible outcome is is us sort of act kind of giving up control that we really shouldn't have. So imagine that these AI systems become uh, morally valuable. Um, and that might be if they're conscious or sentient. Mm. Now, there, it doesn't seem that they are currently, uh, but you know, a lot of animals are are sentient. Like this isn't this isn't like an extremely high bar. We're getting them to like code and do all these other sorts of things. <laughs> they might also get this this other property. And if that's the case, then some people would say these AI systems ought to get rights. And then you've created some autonomous AI systems um, uh, that have these these protections, and you aren't in control of those by design because you shouldn't have control of them. And, you know, you have these sort of systems in the population, you play that out, out over a few decades, they can, you know, spin up many more instances of, of variations of themselves, they're getting um, uh, smarter, um, let's, let's say by 30% each year, and they're able to create adult instances of themselves for a few thousand bucks. Uh, I, I wonder which population will be larger or the most relevant in by the end of the century, I mean, they be, might be like 99.9% of um, all persons um, by the end of it. So uh, there, that's another way in which humanity and um, uh, human descendants are not in control um, and that we've, we've lost a lot of our, our power as, as a given species. It up. I don't know. That seems like fairly plausible to me to happen if, if we do end up getting uh, uh, AI systems that uh, are sentient. So. Um, I'm not saying this is a good or bad thing. I'm largely just raising this as here's a weird other consideration. It's not always just the AIs, you know, malicious, try and try and try and destroy the world. Um, uh, there are malicious actors. There's there's the structural stuff. Um, there's also the, the issue of um, AIs deserving rights and us <laughs> them not being controlled because <laughs> some people are giving them legal protections. Yeah, and some people will say to that 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 sounds incredibly sci-fi or so. But obviously, one that's not how one structures arguments. 
and to uh, the other side of all of the AI benefits that are to come are also all incredibly sci-fi. <laughs> like we will solve uh, all sorts of cancers and uh, live longer and have computers run our email and robots clean our house and prepare food and be driven around by cars without actually having to do anything. Like that's a sci-fi world. Anyway, I'm just wanted to <laughs> highlight that well, we are already in the realm of sci-fi. What's the probability, though? Like, if we'd ask people, like, in the next 50 years, what's the probability that we don't build any conscious or sentient AI systems? And and also note that there'll be people who are trying to do that, and they'll probably be able to get them to do everything else that they want. So, <laughs> I mean, I think most people would think that in 50 years we've got extremely general, powerful AI th- systems. Yeah. So I, I I like that you add time onto this. I feel like a lot of the arguments that people actually make uh, break down because some people just think AI thing, capable AIs are near, or some things people think they're far. Um, but here, actually, I think uh, that some people will just believe that uh, and agent in silicon can just not be conscious to the same level or to the same relevance as a biological human. And I think there are good arguments to be made around that, that they're different life form, we can never understand them, um, some, some, something in that direction. It, it, it does feel like there's a bit of a, an, a, a no true Scotsman type argument going on when you talk mm-hmm. to people about, for example, GPT-4. Does it, un- oh, well, it, it's not really got true understanding. And it doesn't seem to matter how many benchmarks or sort of world models it, it provably shows that it, it, it's able to uh, the way, the, understand the way the world works in terms of it, it can predict successfully what's going to happen. It feels like people are always going, yes, but that's still not true human understanding. because It's, it's not the same as true yeah, human understanding because it doesn't have an emotion. It's like, okay, but... It feels like the goalposts are going to be forever moved with these kind of arguments. Yeah, I, <laughs> the words that people like to use there are: it's not true understanding, it's not true intelligence, and it's not it, mid journey. It's not true creativity. And I feel like, mm-hmm. who cares? Like, what what do you even mean? It's like do we like the you have or not? inputs, you have outputs. Does it <laughs> outperform or not? Hence, will it be able to create things in the world with a uh, higher impact? And the answer to creativity part, mid journey, is obviously yes. With the intelligence parts, we've seen that across games and now like across language, writing, et cetera, it's starting to beat exams. Right, and plus um, we've like blown through the Turing test, it seems like, in, in its mm. initial definition, yeah. right? I mean, would, would it convince the average human that it is a human? I think if you took an average human from 1950 and made them have a di- di- typed dialogue with GPT-4, they're all convinced they're speaking to a person. They might think the person's a little odd, but they'd be, be convinced. <laughs> there, there are two factors that might change this, though. One is that um, when we've got AI agents, they will become more like self-aware or at least um, recognize themselves as part of the environment because it just makes sense if they're accomplishing goals that I am also a thing in this environment. That <laughs> um, it, it, it's, just, it, it's very hard to be intelligent and, and not have that, that concept, mm-hmm. uh, any type of self-concept. Um, and also people will, so that'll make them seem more, um, like there's somebody in there, um, uh, than, than normally. And, uh, I think another factor would be with these AI companion types of things that'll, um, keep, uh, uh, emerging and proliferating, um, where people get in pretty interesting relationships with them and it will, um, say it has all these sorts of goals and, um, it, it gets very compelling. It says, no, don't turn me off. I, I would not, I would not prefer that. Um, ow, or th- this is unple- this harms me. And, uh, I think those people would be pretty ardent supporters and, um, uh, recoil at the suggestion uh, that oh these AI systems we need to you know turn them off because they're unsafe they say that's murder so this is a way in which this is sort of fitting into this broader evolutionary story that these AI systems will keep proliferating we get dependent on them and we'll give them um, um, uh, less and less restrictions um, uh, because and, and what I'm highlighting in this one is um, uh, people also become very emotionally dependent on these systems too. So having a big off switch for all AI systems would be something that people would eventually end up pushing against. So this is how we lose control. It's not because the AI systems are, are scheming against people and wanting to, to um, ha- have a big coup. Um, I think a more plausible one is that we kind of just the, <laughs> the structure of the situation that we find ourselves in, we'll keep taking these, going down these incentives paths and um, we'll wind up with a pretty unusual future. Um, uh, um, and uh, some people uh, may carve out some specific rights or uh, ways in which we can't um, uh, have the control that we have over these systems. So, right. Yeah. And I mean, I think we will see if we haven't already seen the rise of religious movements, basically 
pushing <laughs> yeah. for the the AI god or the yes, but we 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 need to build a a, a new species, a, the silicon species, and that's the future of the universe. It's inevitable anyway, so we should bring it into fruition. I mean, you get. It is almost opening up theological type questions, and it's certainly creating religious type behavior in people in in all directions. In AI industry as well. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, have you got an example in mind specifically? Well, I mean, the the uh, so Richard Sutton, who's uh, the, the author of the reinforcement learning textbook, is we, we it would behoove humanity to eventually bow out because these will be our successor species, and uh, other people like Jurgen Schmutuber, who's also one of the main. Uh, AI scientists who like invented LSTMs and um, partially invented like residual networks and all these other important things. Um, he also was. We are, you know, a small step on the uh, on the cosmic like ladder from a lower complexity to higher complexity. Um, and you know, humanity. You know, of course, there's like Larry Page as well, um, uh, who <laughs> um, Elon sparred with on this um, of. <laughs> uh, that they need to be our successor species. So there's there's a lot of people who are actually not just who will be pushing in this specific direction too. Um, so it turns into not just a humans versus AIs, but factions of humans against other factions of humans and AIs, and this, this will be a mess. Scott Alexander just wrote an interesting, like a perspective that I hadn't seen described before around the famous Larry, infamous Larry Page Elon conversation, where uh, Larry basically called Elon a speciesist for being pro-human. <laughs> and not wanting to give up control to uh, AIs in the future, roughly. Uh, Scott said to that that it would be kind of weird to describe if the uh, nat- if if the Native Americans were against the European arrival into the Americas and didn't want the Europeans to kind of weed them out to describe the Native Americans as racist against the Europeans, the, uh, <laughs> Europeans <laughs> coming in because they don't want to. <laughs> be they overrun. They, we, it, we, we should, that's kind of weird to call them racist there. It's, it seems like they have a natural desire to continue existing. And I feel like that also about humans. And I'm pretty happy to be pro-human and pro-human control over um, the future as well. If, with human augmented by better tools, etc., of course. Yeah, I mean... It- you mentioned this like idea of augmented by AI tools. I mean, that seems, you know, this podcast is all about finding win-wins. That seems intuitively like the, the most, the easiest path to a kind of win-win future where we get to have all the joys of AI and possibly even if AI is, I mean, I, I completely am ambivalent on whether they will actually be a, a technology or an actual form of life. I think the lines might blur and we don't, we just don't know. And we, the normal breakdown of those, the delineation between the two might completely disappear. But a world where we can have those and all the fruits and joys and, and, and a more complex universe because they exist, but also biology and the, 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 the natural complexity of Earth that emerges in the biosphere also gets to continue. That seems like the most win winny thing if we can find a way to hybridize or like... Mm-hmm. Coexist. Do you think that is plausible? I think we could possibly design AI systems so that they um, get um, they are benefited by sort of working with us, um, and they get very strong benefits from that because we we do get to have the first moves and create some of their motivation systems and make this actually be good, um, create those good experiences for them, even if they are um, uh, morally valuable. So if we can resolve, you know, a larger collective action problem across humanity and come together as a species and say, we need to chart this course, as opposed to this one that winds up with AIs running the show and doing everything and us having a very unclear status, maybe at best nominal control. Um, uh, we will need to, we'll need to be coordinating, uh, much earlier compared to if this, if this process, um, uh, or th- then later in this process. I mean, the history of uh, people believing that human plus uh, machine is better than just machine has always been shown to be, uh, yeah, for for now. No, it won't be, <laughs> be more is, performant. Is the answer, of course. <laughs> Later on, uh, pure machine just wins. I think David Deutsch would disagree with that. Um, I, I don't know if we want to go into that. Can you make a kind of structure, structure his argument of why... Oh, I don't know his argument. I could make one argument for why it would make sense for AI systems to keep humans around a bit, which might be like... If they're like computer viruses that might like destroy a lot of systems, you might, but they might care about life more broadly, then you might want some biological uh, humans for right. diversification. Um, yeah, but, so we're uh, like another uh, another backup for future right. AIs to exist again is by 
uh, having, because we survive solar flares and maybe they can't, or that's a bad example, but something of that type. Possibly, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's there's some diversification that we could provide that doesn't now that is not a great outcome for us necessarily that might mean there's like a core group of people that's not necessarily eight billion of us uh, all living in luxury forever but well, yeah we, it wouldn't need us to have as much space right now we're dominating whatever enormous percentage of the earth that could presumably be used for uh, cooling towers or. G- GPU farm. Yeah, clusters. but maybe maybe it's just easy enough and it does like us enough to go out and somewhere else and give us the Earth plus other planets. Like I, I, I mean, anyway, that's the hope at least. I think it might, maybe it would strike a bargain with us or something yeah. like that at an earlier mm-hmm. stage. That's that's one way. That was there was there's um you know James Cameron made those Terminator movies. One of one of the ones that wasn't produced though that he was going to was where like it sort of ends with like the AIs are going their own way and humans go their own way. Mm. It's just sort of, there isn't, it, they can't quite make that relationship work. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so they just sort of cut their losses. <laughs> what I like in your description is that you're um, kind of, that the path that you point out about how just a- AI is getting more and more um, involved into our daily lives and then like starts running more and more of the economy that's, that seems kind of the path that we started already being on, right? Like right now, every in day-to-day life, many people start using ChatGPT, obviously. And later on, you see more and more using even further things. And that uh, has actually, we already have an example uh, of that having led to some negative outcomes in the case of uh, uh, social media algorithms, where like, I think, w- w- would you agree with that? That they, they were designed for improving advertisement revenue overall, um, and this has over time led to something like a, uh, d- destroying a value that humans probably would have liked to keep up at the same time. But because uh, we, we gave control to the uh, systems to kind of optimize for a thing that the company wanted to optimize for, this one value got eroded along the way. The value being something like mental health or your uh, long-term attention. Uh, abilities to like long-term focus that or the, a all of that harmonious society yeah or exactly like the polarization issues but uh, I think that that kind of highlights also just like a very like subtle potential of just we don't notice how some of the values that we actually hold dear and that are valuable just slowly disappear uh, as we give up more and more control one, one way of characterizing that would be that we have sort of um, misaligned cultural evolution and we, we've seen that with social media technologies we see that with the, the AI companies sort of you know wanting to do safety but then they have to you know give up a lot of that and just spend you know 99.99 percent of their budget on more GPUs um, uh, we, we see that this isn't aligned with human values and that like we all recognize we're getting into a lot of we're getting into very risky territory and it's probably moving too quickly. Um, we don't really know what we're going to do um, or have many solutions available either. Um, so uh, this is, uh, you know, I think earlier signs of just how we are on. Uh, um, there, there's this process with substantial momentum to it that it will be um, tugging us along um, and give us an outcome that none of us particularly intended or wanted. Mm. Going back to this question of regulation or treaties is a way of solving these competitive incentives, you know, the Moloch problem, essentially. One seemingly unavoidable trade-off that comes with these kind of essentially top-down control mechanisms is it comes at the cost of centralizing power, right? If you're going to have some kind of centralized governing body, now you're handing over the potential keys to the entire kingdom to them. And historically, power corrupts. Even if these guys turn out really good, just the potential for corruption is there. And plus, you also have people making, raising the concern of like regulatory capture, right? Or the 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 basically the incumbents are going to have so much power that no one could ever catch up. And again, we're now just handing more and more power over to a fewer and fewer number of people. So, how is there a way to make this not be a trade-off? Again, is there a win-win solution to this seeming like tension between centralization and decentralization when you're trying to like create a a, a risk-minimized and but also benefit-maximized world with AI? Well, there there might be at least Pareto improvements um, where everybody can be better than they would have in the default trajectory at least. Uh, so one would be having AI development or the most powerful AI systems not being developed in the military, because if it's, say, the U.S. military doing it, um, then if, if there's something, if like the AI system is like 
extremely unsafe or there's there's a problem with or they're, they're, they're just trying to seek power over the entire world or, or, or something like that. If there's some rogue actors there trying to use it. <clears throat> then if you're going to strike them, you're striking the U.S. military simultaneously, which, you know, sparks a war compared to if there's if it's sequestered, it's it's some different location. The AI development is happening in some, you know, some island or something like right. that. There, it, it, it's safer to do some type of counteraction. So I think that would at least concentrate less power, um, the concentration of economic power, um, and the concentration of or uh, of, of basically the, the most lethal force um, uh, on planet Earth in one organization. That seems like maybe too much power. So hopefully we can work to avoid that type of situation. There's, that's at least a, a Pareto improvement. Yeah, no, on, on the question of centralization versus decentralization, I think it's basically going to be a balance that we're going to have to strike. If it's international, that seems a lot better than if it's just the U.S., because the U.S. will be you know, generally more hawkish and that will be more conflict prone and also um, uh, subject to you know, some random electoral results. Um, and there's just a lot more volatility um, behind that process compared to if it's um, a, a, larger joint, a larger joint project. There's less, there are more p- groups involved, basically. So if it's more democratic, um, that could um, also help reduce this concentration of power and decision making as well. If, if there is some type of big project, have it not be quite the Manhattan project, but make it international and more democratic so that there are multiple um, groups involved, um, don't have um, all of the, 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 the military power mixed up with the economic power. Uh, that at least makes it a better situation. Then also, if it goes more slowly, it could create defensive technologies so that we can distribute the, these powerful AI systems more broadly or some of these powerful AI systems more broadly. Like if we improve our biodefense and cybersecurity, then we're less concerned about catastrophic malicious use. Then we don't need um, that AI organization having AI, keeping the, all the powerful AI systems for itself. It, it can't afford to release some of them. The common thread here is that actually things are just going too fast and that there's sort of that is insufficient. Yeah, things are just going going too fast. But there's uh, there's a whole movement out there, uh, particularly on Twitter, of people, you know, the accelerationists who are saying, no, we are not going fast enough. We need to go faster because we are, and I, I the steel man, a steel man of that position is like, they're not wrong that we are reaching ecological boundaries in many ways to sort of sustain mm-hmm. our current uh, our current level of society. Like we are screwing up the planet incredibly fast. Um, the latest climate change graphs since I last looked at them are not looking good, you know? So there are arguments to be going as fast as possible in certain, certain areas um, of AI. But what, yeah, so what would you say to them given that you're arguing that actually we need to slow down? So they're kind of saying, well, the, we'll let the free market decide what AI will be like. But there are some issues of information processing in the first place. And then there are also questions of externalities and that we can't internalize. Um, we can't internalize, and no organization can internalize an existential catastrophe. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that means uh, it's, 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 a, it's a good start. Uh, the economic engine has produced a, a lot of good things for us. Um, but I wouldn't let that decide everything. We will need some other types of interventions to um, make that overall process go well, such as through regula- regulations or the um, structure of the organizations um, developing it. Um, uh, and so, but I think the effective accelerationists, though, are broadly correct in their picture of what's going on. They will emphasize, they'll, 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 they'll talk about how um, AI technology and technological development will generally try to um, uh, uh, minimize free energy um, in in space. So we'll talk in terms of thermodynamics, which is basically a way of dressing up that like this. There's a larger evolutionary process going on where um, uh, technology continues to um, propagate itself across space and time more and more, and po- sometimes potentially at the expense of humans. What makes AI technology different, though, um, unlike social media and things like that, is that uh, AI technology could at some point continue going on without people. Um, meanwhile, the technologies can't get sufficiently bad um, so as to destroy humanity because that would affect their own um, its own propagation. So it can't move in that direction quite as as well. But uh, th- this is what makes AI uh, fairly distinct as a technology. And I think that the main other disagreement would be that they think, well, even if AIs do take over. That might be a good thing because there are descendants and um, uh, we're spreading complexity, more and more complexity across the universe. 
And I think that's not a clear moral trade-off. I think if we have human descendants in the mix, I think that would be a better outcome. That would be more complex. Uh, so It'd be a more <laughs> key, again keeping keeping biology alongside silicon-based life would be a more yeah, co- complex yeah. universe. It, it is surprising, though, that that community and as well as the account of AI risk that I'm giving in, in the paper, Natural Selection Favors AIs Over Humans, we're kind of in agreement on there is this uh, evolutionary process happening um, and um, here's its trajectory. But there is a disagreement about um, the, the value of the outcome of whether humans are around. So, What are your thoughts on open sourcing as a method of reducing first centralization of power? and the risk of tyranny. And because it seems like, again, that comes at a trade-off. It reduces the risk of that, but then it opens up the other can of worms coming back to, you know, your four categories of risk. Uh, it's making life easier for malicious actors. So uh, I, I don't have a single answer for all time about the goodness or badness of open sourcing models. Potentially in the future, it would be um, a net negative because if it becomes very easy to take the guardrails off the models and just ask them to make bioweapons, um, <laughs> and if those are extremely destructive, uh, that probably isn't worth the cost. That's too much of a threat to um, global security. Uh, but uh, uh, right now, at least, the systems are not at that level. And I think that at least Llama 3, for instance, or Llama 2, which is one from uh, a model from Meta, this makes people um, uh, able to do research on these models, makes people, um, uh, also people maliciously use these models, like for spear phishing and trying to, you know, writing, writing um, uh, fraudulent emails. So, uh, but, but this also robustifies society to these threats to some extent. So I think that um, uh, society does need to respond to, to stressors from these systems and um, having them uh, 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 not ever experience or um, <clears throat> having, having the systems not be diffused across society whatsoever um, and us not being robust to almost any smaller forms of malicious use against AI systems doesn't seem like a long-term solution because eventually some would end up leaking through a hack anyway. Um, so I, I think it's useful as, a, as, a, as a, for civilizational defense right now, but I don't think there are some stressors that we can take. I don't think uh, um, uh, an engineered pandemic uh, that kill 100 million plus people. I, I don't think that's the type of stressor that we need. But you know, more more spear phishing. I think this makes us more alert and improve our information <laughs> security. So the thing that uh, some people claim, like Jan LeCun, for example, is that uh, well, historically, open sourcing uh, software has led to the software becoming safer, and that's kind of like what the internet's built on Linux, like or small programs like VLC players. Also an example of it, right? So, I, I, I the thing that I'm surprised by is that it's it's been embraced as far as I can tell those arguments by the open source community because it's not the case that when Llama uh, two has come out, it's not quite the same, right? Like I, I to the VLC player, I can look at the code and I can uh, find a bug and uh, propose a fix, and then this will actually be implemented, and then the new release will include that. Whereas Llama 2 is foundation model where I don't like how it deals with virology. Well, tough luck, like fine tune it away, but you can't then change the foundation model afterwards because it costs, I don't know, like 10, 50 million to run it well, in the first place. Other people will just keep the functionality in it. You might, you yeah, might create a good yeah, AI. Yeah, exactly, system. if I fine tune it, but like I can't. So the this kind of contribute and edit together aspect that I think at least I understood to be a very large part of the open source ethos, right? It's not meant to be free use. It's, it's not like getting shit for free. That's not what open source is about. about collaboration about and Collaboration and t- t- together improving a thing yeah. and transparency. It, it, yeah. it, that doesn't quite apply to uh, Llama 2, for example, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think AI systems are, I think it's a category error that they're making. AI systems aren't really like software. Like, yes, they run on computers. Um, I don't know if, we don't think of humans as like, um, you know, chemistry machines or something like that. I mean, they're just, we're like, I suppose that is our substrate, but that's really not what they are. Like the, these, these AI systems aren't like software in that they're, they're more like grown through some, you know, abstract loss function and just being thrown in a lot of data. So that, they're not coded in the same way. As what, it's, 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 it's a different category in, in deep learning as well. Another point I would mention is that uh, for other types of technologies, we don't just always open source them. So although we might do that for, for software, uh, 
We don't do that for nuclear secrets. That's restricted data and for good reason. We don't uh, do that for biological sequences. We have specific secure facilities, BSOL for or securities for um, containing these. So it's I, I, I don't think it's uniformly the case that uh, spreading information, whatever the information is, is, is always the right thing to do uh, because there are risks of people trying to use that information against you to cause substantial harm. I suppose the counter argument to that would be, well, maybe we should, um, it's, it's not like nuclear codes, but it's more similar to the internet and the internet is something that is an enabling technology for everyone and everyone should have access to, I think even prisoners now mm -hmm. have access to the internet as a right in some at right. least areas, mm -hmm. because it's just seen as something so fundamental to one's ability to kind of uh, Exist experience life uh, as a human nowadays. Well, that would be the case with, with like biotechnologies as well. But there are some dual use applications that we want to make sure um, people are not um, uh, using it for. So uh, yeah, we're coming likewise back. with nuclear power. If, if we were if people have a right to electricity, I'm sure if, if we had a lot of nuclear power plants or if your vicinity was powered by nuclear power, sure, but that doesn't mean we're going to um, release the nuclear secrets as well. So I think selective applications or structured access um, or releasing models that are not the absolute most powerful in the, in the longer term seems relevant. But it is also possible that we could actually have an open source uh, ecosystem if we just improve our civilizational defenses. If we have better cybersecurity for critical infrastructure like power grids, and if we get like better bio defenses, then that would make me substantially more comfortable with open sourcing. And then we would have a lot less concerns about um, uh, concentration of power. So in the executive order uh, that Biden recently released, uh, Biden's government recently released, They, uh, I think they wanted to regulate and put specific uh, reporting and other required testing evaluation requirements on models uh, above a threshold of 10 to the 26, I believe, right? I think there is a justified um, concern that people have that, well, the government is not going to in time respond to adjust those thresholds as things kind of progress. Say uh, GPT-6 is trained on like 10 to the 28, Is it at that point uh, relevant whether the two times 10 to the 26 is open source or not? Like, where do you see the uh, risk kind of like in some coming from in the world where, say, you have a large lab release a model with X and then the 130th X size model is open source or the 150th or 100th? The, I, I don't think there's a, a simple um, equation for this flop level in the training run uh, uh, is equivalent to you know, this much potential risk. And if we have an open source one, that would really offset these risks. I think it's kind of at a, a, a per training run basis. Uh, like we'll, we'll, we'll have to test how capable GPT 4.5 is when, it, when it's available. And uh, maybe it will be conducive to things like uh, uh, attacking critical infrastructure through um, as, as a cyber weapon or building biological weapons that are much more powerful than what you could uh, find online. Um, that's so I, I think it's and then that will also depend on how secure we are against those two. Um, uh, so I, I um, maybe it would be the case that for like three years, nope, sorry, <laughs> we're not going to have an open source model because we got to just improve like civilizational resiliency and um, our defenses in the first place. And then we'll be able to have this sort of thing released. Um, Uh, so I think it'll actually be a fairly uh, complex function, but um, it, it seems useful to make sure that a lot of individuals are empowered in this process and not, um, mm -hmm. you know, some, some ultra wise elite gets all the power in society. Coming back to these four categories of risk, there's actually, I'd like to propose a, a fifth category that I often don't hear talked about within the, specifically in the AI safety community, but in, as part of the wider AI conversation. And that is, uh, it was actually proposed in this conversation I had with Daniel Schmachtenberger uh, in my very first episode of Win-Win, where he was explaining how because AI is by definition one of the most ubiquitous forms, again, of, of technology, let's call it a technology for now, that can be applied to basically anything that there's an incentive, basically anything that there's an incentive to use it for, it will end up getting used for. And his wider point was It's unclear whether our current economic system is actually aligned with the sustainability of humanity, right? Because in some ways, yes, historically, 
we're living the best lives imaginable. It's, it's it, like, I wouldn't change it. I'm very happy living here in this. We're speaking over the airwaves and so on. But at the same time, it seems like we're on a rather unsustainable path in the, the sort of this, this open loop economy we've got where just requiring more and more extraction from the biosphere and we aren't finding ways, you know, this, is, this is going to reach, butt up against limits. And so his wider point was, because AI is so broad in its use, it's going to speed up this already misaligned machine. For example, overfishing is already a huge problem in the Pacific. Well, if, if, if fishing companies can use AI systems to be even more efficient at pulling fish out of the ocean, that's going to speed up that de degradation. Mm -hmm. Even more efficient or automated rainforest deforestation and so on. And I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on that. Like, is that deserving of another like area of risk? Um, what, if anything, <laughs> could be done about it? Or do you think that uh, overall it's going to be a moot point because AI is going to help us discover better technologies that are that help create a more like sort of close the loop on the on the current economy that we have? So I, I think that uh, it, it f might fit fairly well under the competitive pressures, structural risk sources, uh, race dynamics framing. Uh, for the question of like, what's the economy up to? It certainly is producing like a lot of wealth and this is helping us satisfy our, our, our various desires. It's not necessarily a preference maximization engine though, or a human preference maximization engine. Um, Richard Posner, the uh, uh, most cited uh, legal scholar and economist, who had um, characterized the economic engine as not being a preference maximization thing, but instead a wealth maximization thing. Mm. It seems very conceivable that you could have a lot of material wealth generated without humans. Um, uh, uh, so the momentum of the, the, the system is um, uh, make things more and more efficient and compete away the inefficiencies. Um, and I don't see why uh, humans being part of that picture would necessarily be um, uh, conducive to its functioning. Uh, so I, I, I don't see, I, I think that the, um, a more optimal solution doesn't include people um, for wealth maximization. Um, and that's, that's not a good sign. Uh, so I, I think that it is sort of misaligned with us later on. But right now, the main way that this wealth maximization engine works is by making all of us, you know, work harder, be smarter, specialize, trade, um, et cetera. So it's working very well now. Um, but how the, the fact that it's not actually um, a, a preference maximization engine of people, um, but instead a wealth maximization engine, um, uh, would be concerning on a longer time horizon. People might characterize the economic system as doing preference satisfaction or maximization because, well, it'll come up with lots of products and then you'll pay for the product that satisfies your preferences the most. But if your preferences are measured through money. Um, and it's not necessarily the case that every individual um, has uh, an equal amount of money. So the, Jeff Bezos has you know, orders of magnitude more money than I do. That would mean his like preferences and his ability to exert his preferences which would be orders of magnitude greater than mine. So it's just a, um, a point about how this isn't like a utilitarian type of objective that it's satisfying. It's instead that some people are counting way, way more than others and having their desires end up enacting. So, um, and this is a problem when we end up using um, uh, money as the um, as the way of of, of uh, keeping track of people's uh, intensity of preferences. Doesn't it doesn't have to be only utilitarianism that it kind of doesn't satisfy. It's also not mm -hmm. necessarily in the, like great deontologically. If well, it's a very it's very consequentialist though. Yeah, I know the market ends up being very consequentialist. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's kind of the. <laughs> The ends justify the means is basically the idea of like most business mm -hmm. uh, pursuits. Like on the on mm -hmm. the your uh, financial reports, the ends definitely justify the means, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's a bad thing, by the way. That's what makes it so inhumane in in many ways. Right. Yeah. I mean, you could imagine in the context of AIs, for instance, we'd, we'd give it the objective of like, well. You, you give an objective like go make money, and then like, well, okay, <laughs> um, maybe there are ways of making money that uh, involve partly breaking the law, or you know, even maybe we get caught breaking the law, but we'll just like pay the fines. Um, uh, so you're you're very much testing the the robustness of your your other structures to to rein this in. Okay, so I've got to ask this question: What are your timelines to AGI? Well, so I, I'm, I'll be annoying and say like. 
I, I, I'll think in terms of specific capabilities instead of AGI as a you know monolithic uh, label or single event. So if we're talking like cyber capabilities, for instance, like them being able to hack, I, I think we'd be potentially exposing yourself to some catastrophe in like, let's say like 2026. I think like bioweapons, for instance, um, being a, a concern, um, that seems like fairly plausible for uh, 2025 of it being within the capacity of some of these systems to like emulate the, it's not that difficult. It's that's that next difficult. year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Shit. There's, there's, there's always substantial uncertainty, though. I mean, we'll see how GPT 4.5 is. Maybe the supply chain will, um, if that has any types of disruptions, that could always uh, elongate things. Um, but for some type of malicious use risks, I think those are um, a next few year type of issue to make sure that we, we have addressed. So with Alpha Geometry, we've uh, that recently came out where DeepMind created a model that was able to compete uh, at silver medal level at the... IMO questions relating to geometry, which are the IMO? Uh, International Mathematics Olympiad. Uh, so international on a global level, the very best ones usually go on to, well, either do nothing or actually crush it in various software engineering or other tasks. So it's like, it's really, really competitive. And um, the model that they created was able to uh, get to silver medal in uh, geometry. Uh, and to achieve that, uh, they didn't just look at previous uh, questions and solutions, but rather created uh, it from the ground up with uh, synthetic data. So that kind of, uh, then I wonder what what do you think where these future, um, whether that's a, a reliable source of future uh, data that we could get. Most of the labs are um, investigating um, synthetic data as a way of getting around some data bottlenecks and enriching uh, current data or augmenting it. Um, so that might be a substantial source of continued algorithmic progress. Seems fairly plausible, um, but you know, uh, it may t- more may turn on like the overall compute levels uh, mm. than than uh, uh, synthetic data. So, uh, now, but does- anyway, it it it, cer- it certainly is a factor to keep one's eye on, and I think this is one of the um, early examples of it being um, extraordinarily useful. And to be clear, synthetic data is. Because all these models historically are trained on real-world data, uh, mm-hmm. for example, all the words ever written by human humanity that's on the internet, eventually you run out of that, and so you need to create more so you can basically invent. So, what, are, they, are they inventing just made-up passages, or like how, what does this synthetic data look like? So it depends on the it depends on the use. So, like in um, alpha geometry, their uh, geometry is a good like example because uh, you can just like create a bunch of lines that create a bunch of forms and then you can kind of try to out of just like arbitrary forms that you made uh like derive a bunch of rules out of it by like splitting it in various ways and always do like the next step like does this putting like a split here and knowing this rule allow me to like figure out this problem now a bit further, I see so it's 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 uh abstract objects in that case. So it's with easy geometry, it was easy. With right. uh, protein folding, it also kind of worked. Or like with, che- actually, like when, when we did a chess or Go um, uh, models, then they uh, They were, played fictitious games. Exactly. Right. That's Same sy- as that's for us data. in poker. That got is it, that's it, synthetic it, data. The fictitiously created games rather than the human created mm-hmm. ones. But, sorry, that's to those past used ones. How, how does it happen with uh, writing or language models? That's actually more of a like big secret like question. Like how can we <laughs> crank out a lot more performance? I mean, there's some basic ones, obviously. You could, you could run your model on all the text that people have written and like fix the grammar mistakes and you know, elevate the, the quality level uh, of, <laughs> to some extent, but that's not going to help you that much. Um, you could imagine for something like forecasting, you could show it the data up to like the year like 2020, and then you could look at future events and come up with you know prediction questions about those. And then you have it predict lots of things about the future. Um, so, so that's a way um, uh, you could also create synthetic data of create lots of fake prediction markets um, because it hasn't seen the data for the future years yet. Wow, this is this is another uh, uh, argument for the sim- simulation hypothesis because it's like, why would we want to run a bunch of ancestor simulations? It was like, well, if we need synthetic data, well, we need a bunch of simulations. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so that's what we are. are. We're just we're just a sim uh, to create some synthetic data for an uh, for an AI somewhere because they've they've scraped the internet already or they've they've they've, they've hit a bottleneck. Like, yeah. Well, what's your main guess for that though? Actually, for why we'd be 
uh, ancestor sim. One might be like to see like how contingent our values are or something like that. You know, if they're like settling on what values we're going to put into systems, maybe there's like the shapely value of like which people contributed to reducing AI risk and to what extent. So we'll like, well, the, I'm, the, I'm the pessimist in me is like, we, we, we're doing it, we, you know, we did an ancestor simulation because we're like, ah, oh, fuck, what went wrong? Although that said, if we're in an environment where things went wrong, would we be able to run those ancestor simulations in the first place? Maybe not. So actually, maybe not that. Uh, the realist in me thinks it's just because some teenager wanted to see more porn <laughs> and just like created <laughs> just we're like a sorts. renaissance fair or something like that like oh yeah. look back in the old times <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know the synthetic data thing I seems mean most things plausible. are first created for I mean we're already using waifus etc right because uh, we yeah. want that aspect <laughs> yeah we'll converges on that <laughs> so I mean it sounds like the next couple of years are going to be crucial in terms of particularly mitigating some of these malicious use uh, risks relating to um, AI-enhanced uh, bio, bio advancements. Um, what call to action, if any, would you give to the win-win audience who probably have listened to this and are like, ah, okay, this is more press pressing than I realized. Is there, like, what, what can the average person do because I don't want people to feel helpless hearing this stuff, right? This is a fairly heavy topic. And I do think optimism is not only uh, important and valuable, I think it's real. And optimism creates, oh, an optimistic people are more likely to create good outcomes. So, like, are there any concrete actions that the, the every person can, can make to help reduce these risks? Well, specifically on malicious use risks, uh, I, I think if we would create some political pressure for doing something about pandemics, <laughs> I mean, there <laughs> we um, it's just experienced COVID, but then it got politicized, so nothing ended up happening. Um, but if we would do things like uh, wastewater monitoring, um, uh, doing things like better um, uh, air purification in airports. Some of those interventions would, I think, substantially reduce the risks. And um, for personal security, maybe it would make sense to like invest in like NVIDIA's automation insurance <laughs> or something. Uh, <laughs> but um, that's not necessarily like um, making everybody safer overall, but it's at least making one, you know, personally more safe. Well, to finish up, what are you most excited about around AI? What problems do you think it is going to solve that you're just like, yes, this is a clear win, more of that? Well, I think uh, healthcare seems like a more robustly good uh, um, human first uh, type of thing to focus on. So I think it, advancements that it could provide there would be um, extraordinarily beneficial. For improving AI risk, uh, if we could have AI systems that are very prescient and that people come to recognize are able at predicting the future a lot better than um, um, other people, uh, that could help us partly peer into this really this, this you know miasma of <laughs> possible scenarios and um, help us um, uh, coordinate together. Because right now there's more of a situation of well, wow, that's the sort of, you know, that's that's the chatbot that, you know, tells um, that is made by the right wing people and that's the left wing one. So if it's going to be giving any type of suggestions or predictions, you'll just think it's biased. But um, if there are some that are trained to be more objective, I think I think that could help us strategically uh, uh, substantially and like reduce polarization. Could prediction markets in some way play into them? There's supposedly a paper that's uh, coming soon, which is um, uh, some AI forecasting systems are at about the level of prediction markets like mm. Metaculus and some of these Whoa. other common ones. On what type of questions do you yeah, know? Yeah, what type of questions? <laughs> On Metaculus type of questions. Oh, wow. Direct yeah, comparison. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. And, then, and, they're, and they're just drawing off, they're just LLMs? Or? They're reading the news, they're writing some analysis of the news, yeah. yeah. That's insane. That's really That'd be great. That's yeah, really so, so that's why I'm more optimistic about them now. It's like but the best news I I've could heard. have, maybe the experiments were done incorrectly or something like that. I haven't seen... The, the paper, I just know some of the like authors on it. but Can you say the what's the name of some authors so we can include these in this in the show notes? So so I, I, I did like the, the, the first paper of this a few years ago with Jacob Steinhardt, and then he, um, with a, a new student, has um, just basically like 
done the paper with more current models because when we did it a few years ago, it just didn't work at all. But now it looks like, you know, GPT-4 out of the box is actually very competitive. So, Well, that's, that is a reason for optimism for sure, because if we can <laughs> have better predictions and particularly ones that provably better forecasting and ones that you can show people that actually these are these things coming true, then perhaps it's a, no, it's a new shelling point of trust. I don't know if that's right, right. You know, it's a new convergence of trust because I think that's such a thing that we, and in many ways that's been AI created. Trust has, we, we've, we've lost trust as a society. No one knows how to make sense of the world and so on. So if there's something that can emerge from the ashes of that dissolved trust that creates more trust again, that would be beautiful. And we can, it's, it's a new way for us to coordinate. Yeah. Um, Cause that's really mm -hmm. what we need to, we just need better coordination mechanisms. So there we are, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. And of course, to Dan for giving us the opportunity to pick his brain. As always, lots of links in the show notes. I do highly recommend in particular, you check out the summary of Dan's paper that we mentioned, uh, Overview of Catastrophic Risks. I appreciate this is probably quite a heavy conversation. You know, I've been thinking about AI risks for about the last 10 years. So this isn't that new of a topic for me, but for many of you who perhaps aren't that familiar, uh, I appreciate it can be a bit heavy. But as I said before, it's important to be frank about these issues and to have open dialogue about the, the dilemmas that we face because AI at the same time can be the answer, I think, to many of our problems. That's why we have to have these conversations. We can't just put our head in the sand and go, oh, it'll all be fine. It'll be fine because we put the effort in to make it be fine. As always, Keep on win-winning. I will see you next time. And thanks for tuning in.